Sometimes in this world, money can't buy happiness. But when you have to fund a baseball team, this term is immediately thrown out the window. Unless if you're the Oakland A's, then you can find underrated players through other teams and in the farm system, and you can somehow make the playoffs. The 2002 Oakland A's were the X-Factors. After losing Damon, Giambi, and Isringhausen, the team itself was in a limbo. Then GM Billy Bean found a bunch of players that suited their needs at the time. Guys like Scott Hatterberg, David Justice, Chad Bradford, and Ricardo Rincon. David Justice was a player that was past his prime at 37. Scott Hatterberg was almost out of baseball due to injury to his arm before transitioning him to first base. Chad Bradford was overlooked by teams because of his freaky windup. Ricardo Rincon had a down year in Cleveland, so they acquired him by trade. Include that and the best pitching staff in baseball with Tim Hudson, Barry Zito, and Mark Mulder, and you have yourself a 20-game winning streak and a 103-win season. If you look carefully, all these players acquired by the Athletics are all no-names, past their prime, or young players on their rookie deals. Unfortunately, they can't sign guys like Eric Chavez, Nick Swisher, and Houston Street to big extensions because they simply can't afford it. The 2006 Oakland A's were their last playoff team of the 2000s. This team made it all the way to the ALCS before getting swept by the Tigers. That team had affirmation names like Chavez, Swisher, and Street, but they also had guys like Dan Heron, Bill Blanton, Jason Kendall, Mark Kotze, Marco Scudero, and Frank Thomas in his twilight. Usually after a big season, a team would look to the offseason and add after the playoff failure. However, the A's can't do that, so Barry Zito can sign with the Giants, Marco Scudero can be traded to Toronto, but bigger losses occurred. Dan Heron had an all-star pitching performance that year. 15 wins, an ERA of 307, and 222 innings pitched. You'd think with a performance like this, that the Athletics would want more of this in their pitching staff for years to come. However, in December that year, he was traded to the Arizona Diamondbacks. You have to strike while the iron is hot, so they traded a player in his prime for a bunch of prospects. They got a haul from him too acquiring key names like Brett Anderson, Chris Carter, and Carlos Gonzalez. After the Heron trade, they sent Nick Swisher to the Chicago White Sox for prospects Gio Gonzalez and Ryan Sweeney. While the trades had potential, they also acquired guys in the waiver wire. Guys like Rajay Davis, for example. Now with good moves like this, the team would be in an upcoming playoff contender, right? Well, we need to look again, because it's like every move that Billy Bean makes, he undoes it with a questionable one. Think of training Tim Hudson to the Braves. This one may be excusable because of the budgetary issues and their then horrific farm system, but the guys that they got back never developed. Andre Ethier to the Dodgers is another one. They acquired him for Milton Bradley. Should I really, really get into what Milton Bradley has done? But however, these next two are gonna stick. Nelson Cruz to the Milwaukee Brewers for Keith Ginter. Ginter didn't even play a full season with the team before retiring, and Nelson Cruz turned into a cornerstone power hitter for the Rangers, Orioles, Mariners, Twins, Rays, you get the goddamn point. The next one might sting a little bit more, because Street and Gonzalez both ended up getting traded to the Rockies for Matt Holliday. And Gonzalez was important because he was supposed to be the next key piece to their roster as their franchise player for the future. Matt Holliday never lasted a year with the team as he was traded to the Cardinals for, wait for it, Clayton Mortensen and Brett Wallace at the deadline. Wallace was supposed to be good at the time, but he also got traded in the offseason to the Toronto Blue Jays for Michael Taylor. No, not that Michael Taylor, the other Michael Taylor. Little did they know that their new core was slowly forming. In the 2009 offseason, after training Wallace to Toronto, they signed Coco Crisp to play center field. Now for the funny part. In the 2010 draft, they selected a 6'7 outfielder named Aaron Judge. However, they didn't sign him because he wanted to play college ball. Probably for the best, right? Here's another one. Edwin Encarnacion was put on waivers by the Blue Jays, and the A's acquired him. But literally less than a month later, he had granted free agency. Talk about missing a superstar, right? While Rajay Davis wasn't a superstar, his speed was his game. They lost that when they traded him to the Blue Jays as well for Danny Farquhar. Yeah, I don't know about that one. But hey, here's past prime Hideki Matsui and Josh Willingham. This Brad Ziegler guy reminds me a lot of Chad Bradford, so let's trade him to the Diamondbacks. Although here's a bright spot. Brandon Moss is a power hitter on the cheap. 
Craig Breslow and Trevor Cahill can be traded to Arizona for Ryan Cook and Jared Parker. Andrew Bailey had a couple good seasons, but he's no match for Josh Reddick's potential. Let's trade him and Ryan Sweeney to the Red Sox. With all this momentum, let's sign Bartolo Colon and Johnny Gomes to contracts and get Seth Smith from the Rockies. But there's a big Cuban outfielder waiting for us, and his name is Joannis Cespedes. Probably one of the best players out of Cuba in this generation. A 5-2 player that will certainly help the A's push for a playoff spot. A four-year, $36 million contract. Probably the only thing that the A's spent that decade. Within a heartbeat, the team was a playoff contender once again. Yoenis Cespedes leading the offense, with up-and-comers like Josh Donaldson, Brandon Moss, Josh Reddick, and another Diamondback acquisition, Stephen Drew, carried this team on their backs. They traded catcher Kurt Suzuki to the Nationals, but this only gave time for Derek Norris to shot. Along with purchases of Pat Neshek and Jesse Chavez for the bullpen, they had guys like Jerry Blevins, young Sean Dooler, Ryan Cook, and closer Grant Balfour. The starting rotation was iffy, but it still had Cologne, Parker, Anderson, and Tommy Malone. All of this led them to a 93-win season, a dramatic ending to a promising season as they take over the Rangers' spot in first place after sweeping them in the last series of the season. Unfortunately for them, they ran into a giant in the Detroit Tigers, a World Series contender in all but name. They fought and fought till they had nothing left. Game 5 was the example of this. Justin Verlander dominates like he usually does, and the A's go without a whimper. 2013 was the year though. Their younger guys turning into all-stars. Dan Straley and AJ Griffin coming into their own. Sonny Gray becoming a key piece in the rotation. Coco Crisp having a career year. Eric Sogard and Jed Lowry in the middle infield. A 96-win season winning their division for the second consecutive season. All the momentum needed for them as they are up two games to one in the rematch series against the Tigers. There's a fly ball, struck well to right field. Reddick moves back to the track, leaps at the wall, and that ball is, is gone! Victor Martinez would like to challenge that aspect, and the Tigers come back and win a tightly contested Game 4. Game 5 was a repeat of 2012, as Verlander dominates and Cabrera leads the offense to the ALCS. Another failed season for Moneyball. Billy Bean was embarrassed. They had seen enough, and it was time to go all in for 2014. The bullpen was full of nobodies, so it was time to upgrade. The trade master acquired Jim Johnson from the Orioles and Luke Gregerson from San Diego. Brett Anderson faltered last year, so we don't need that in our small window. Off you go to Colorado. Jerry Blevins, we don't have enough room for you and you're showing regression. Have fun in Washington. We need speed in our lineup, so Sam Fold and Billy Burns, come on down to Oakland. A risk is needed, and a couple were taken. They traded their better prospects to the Cubs for Jeff Samarja and Jason Hamill, but a big one was at the deadline. Yoenis Cespedes to the Red Sox for Johnny Gomes and John Lester. As a Red Sox fan, I was salty, but it was time for a rebuild. Adam Dunn and Giovanni Soto were acquired for power depth. They were ready for a long postseason run. They were up 7-3 against the Royals in the sixth inning of the wildcard game. Unfortunately, after Lester was pulled, the bullpen underachieves and gives up four runs to tie the game. Slapped into left field and the A's have the lead. As long as they keep their lead intact, this team will be making their third straight appearance in the ALDS. This team against a division rival. Then the A's outfield forget their fundamentals and give up a run in three batters to tie the game again. Come on guys, if you can get it out here, you have another chance. Salvador Perez takes that thinking and shoves it down your throat. Season over in horrific fashion. Congratulations A's, you just lost to a team with no expectations. The dismantling had soon begun, and a new core was once again upon us. The big blow was on November 28th. Josh Donaldson to the Blue Jays for Kendall Graveman and Brent Lowry. 
Brandon Moss was traded to Cleveland. Jeff Samarja was traded to the White Sox for key prospects in Josh Fegley, Chris Bassett, Rangel Ravello, and Marcus Semien. Derek Norris was traded to the Padres. John Lester left in free agency. Although they did acquire Ben Zobrist, they saw what they could get for him and traded him at the deadline that year to the Royals for Sean Manaya. Scott Casimir was traded to Houston. Brett Lowry got traded in that same offseason to the White Sox for J.B. Wendelkin. They also traded Jacob Nottingham to Milwaukee for Chris Davis. Jesse Chavez was traded to the Blue Jays for Liam Hendricks. They reacquired Jed Lowry from Houston. Josh Reddick and Coco Chris were the last of their former hitting core, and they traded Reddick and Rich Hill to the Dodgers in 2016 for a couple minor leaguers and Frankie Montas. And finally, Coco Crisp was sent off to Cleveland. 2017 was the year for the future. While they didn't have the stars yet, they were a promising team moving forward. Although they had veterans like Sean Doolittle and Ryan Madsen still around, they soon traded them to Washington for prospects Jesus Lazardo, Sheldon Noose, and Blake Trinan. Sonny Gray was also traded. He went to the Bronx for Dustin Fowler, James Capriellen, and Jorge Mateo. Even young and unproven guys like Ryan Healy were sent to Seattle for a minor leaguer and Emilio Pagan. You may not have known it then, but the Astros gave them Ramon Laureano for a random player in Brandon Bailey. 2018, however, was an unexpected one. This team came into fruition as a serious playoff contender. Guys like Matt Olson and Matt Chapman turning into franchise cornerstones. Jed Lowry having an all-star season, Marcus Semien as a legitimate shortstop, Chris Davis becoming the American League home run king, Mark Hanna and Steven Piscotty becoming star caliber players, Sean Manaya coming to his own, and rookie Frankie Montas. And in that bullpen, oh boy that bullpen, Lou Trevino, Emilio Pagan, Kendall Graveman, Juris Familia, Fernando Rodney, Yusmero Petit, Liam Hendricks, and Blake Trinan as their closer. Want to know how good Trinan was that year? Talk about an ERA under one in 68 games. Their ace, Sean Manaya suffered a season-ending injury just before the playoffs. So Bob Melvin saw his pitching depth and made it a bullpen game right out of the gate. And a draw. Deep left. Two nothing Yankees. After a 97-win season, the team looked great. However, the Yankees were a much bigger market. I mean, team. They lost their first wildcard game back 7-2 as the Yankee bullpen shows them how it's done. But fortunately for them, they were a team with no expectations, so they were happy with their future. What they needed was depth. Signing Joaquin Soria solidified the bullpen, and they traded for Tanner Roark at the deadline. They acquired both Jerickson Profar and Robbie Grossman for extra bats. It worked. Another 97-win season as they made their first wildcard spot. They had home field advantage this time, and Melvin appointed Sean Manaya as their starter. However, the return of Manaya was cut short as he gave up three runs in his only two innings of work. The Rays came into town and destroyed their hopes, winning 5-1. to one. Their former piece Emilio Pagan closed them out to add insult to injury. While they still had a good future, they lost a few pieces. Blake Trinan left for greener pastures in LA. Jerkson Profar was traded to San Diego and prospect Jorge Mateo was also traded there later that year. They added to the hitting core by acquiring Tommy Lestella from the Angels. Liam Hendricks won Closer of the Year, along with the dominating offense and starting pitching. They won their division in the shortened 60-game season and won their first playoff series in 13 years. And it's driven a deep left field for Correa. Grossman going back, and that ball is long gone. Unfortunately, they ran into a machine in Houston, and they got dominated in four games in the ALDS. Just like 2013, Bean wanted to do whatever he could to make this team a World Series contender for 2021. But as usual for the A's, it's one step forward, two steps back. Marcus Semien and Liam Hendricks signed with different teams in the offseason. While Hendricks I saw coming, Semien signed with the Blue Jays for a one-year prove-it deal. The A's could have easily matched it. But, you know, I digress. They can make up for it with moves in the offseason. Bean's the trade master, remember? His first move is trading Chris Davis and Jonah Heim to the Rangers for Elvis Andrews, an inferior replacement towards Semyon on a decline. They re-signed past prime Jed Lowry, signed Sergio Romo, and Rosenthal for the bullpen. They added to their death by signing Mitch Moreland. The team itself was still good, only missing Hendricks and Semyon. 
Chris Bassett, Sean Murphy, and Seth Brown developed quite nicely. Frankie Montas became their ace that they had desperately needed. Their bullpen was just as formidable as years past. All they needed to do was add at the deadline, and they did just that by trading prospect Jesus Lazardo to the Marlins for Starling Marte. They then traded a few minor leaguers to the selling Nationals for Jan Gomes and Josh Harrison as depth pieces. They even re-signed Chris Davis back for a depth role. All they have to do is beat the Seattle Mariners once and they'll be in the playoffs. Barrel crush! This is on its way! Three-run home run! Mitch Hanniger would like to have a word with you. Seattle sweeps the A's in humiliating fashion and eliminates them from playoff contention. Gotta love Oakland losing. It's always in a unique way. Next up was the offseason, and oh boy was it eventful. Jan Gomes signed with the Cubs. Josh Harrison signed with the White Sox. Mark Canna and Starling Marte signed with the Mets. Jake Diekman signed with Boston. They traded Chris Bassett to the Mets as well. Matt Olson was traded to the Braves for Christian Pache and prospect Shea Langoliers. Matt Chapman was traded to the Blue Jays. To further twist the knife, Bob Melvin left the organization after 10 years to join San Diego. But it's okay, you signed an inexperienced Mark Kotze. But hey, at least you re-signed Steven Vogt. That's not all. As Frankie Montas and Lou Trevino were traded to the Yankees for minor leaguers and prospect Ken Waldachuk, more heartbreak happened during the season. No, not the expected 68-win season. Not even the suspension of Ramon Laureano but the releases of Jed Lowry and Steven Piscotty. The only good thing about that season was Steven Vogt hitting a home run in his last career at bat. I know it's not much, but Vogt was a fan favorite so it counts. The final move was made in the offseason last year. On December 12th, 2022, they traded Sean Murphy to the Braves in a three-way trade. Now sitting at 2023, this team will be on the rebound for the next couple of seasons before their next players develop. While there is still hope, it may not be for the city of Oakland. The Athletics just bought land in Las Vegas where they'll be building a new stadium. The set date is 2027. For the Athletics themselves, it's just like anyone on their team. They develop well to play somewhere else. It's almost fitting in a way. As a farewell, I'm going to make a montage of all the players they have lost. Actually, at this point, just abolish the team. Keep 